Welcome to Girls in the World, Middle Grade Fiction, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. If you haven't read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, Book No Further, please visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Also, we appreciate the help of our community partners in sharing this event. Thank you. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers. Elizabeth Bunce, author of the Myrtle Hardcastle Mystery Series, lives in Kansas City with her husband and their cats. Premeditated Myrtle is her first book for middle grade readers. Hena Khan, author of Amina's Song, is a Pakistani-American writer. She is also the author of middle grade novels, Amina's Voice, and More to the Story, as well as a number of picture books. She lives in her hometown of Rockland, Maryland, Rockville, Maryland. Angie Smybert, author of The Truce, lives in Roanoke, Virginia. The Truce is the third novel in her middle grade Ghosts of Ordinary Objects series. The first book, Bones Gift, won a 2019 Whipperwill Award for Rural Young Adult Fiction. She teaches for Southern New Hampshire University's MFA program, as well as for Indiana University. And our moderator, Hannah Barnaby, is a children's book author and creative writing instructor. She holds an MA in children's literature and an MFA in writing for children and young adults. Her recent books include the Monster and Boy chapter book series. She lives in Charlottesville with her family. Thank you all for joining us today. Hannah, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Welcome, Hannah and Elizabeth and Angie. I'm excited to have this chance to talk with you today about your books and about middle grade fiction and about girls in middle grade fiction specifically. Um, it's, I think, a very strange time to be in publishing, but it's also um, in some ways a really exciting time, especially in writing for this age group. So I'm, I'm really excited for the chance to have this conversation. I thought um, for those who haven't read your books or even for those of us who have read your books but haven't heard you read your books, it would be nice to start with a little bit of reading from each of you to give everyone a sense of the feel of your book and who your main character is. Um, Angie, would you be willing to go first? Uh, sure, I'd be glad to read from my latest one, The Truce. And now I need to set this up a little bit. It is the third one in a trilogy, which starts with Bones Gift and Lingering Echoes. And in this book, uh, it's set in 1942 in a small coal mining uh, village in the New River Valley. And the main character, Bone Phillips, has this special gift where she can touch an object and see the ghost inside of it. And she's using it to, in each book, to sort of solve a different mystery, both sort of personal and, you know, out in the community kind of mystery. The, the truce, I'm going to read you like the scary bit. Um, this is where she and her friends are out sort of on a stakeout. And they know that something has happened at a particular spot outside the mine uh, after a body was found there. So I'm going to have to take off my glasses here. OK, so the coal train chugged east toward the port in Norfolk and the war. The tipple shut down. The bone elbowed others awake. No truck had it appeared. Nothing happened for several very long minutes. Then the barn owl screeched again. Then a large black dog the size of a yearling walked out of the shadows. And the dog stood directly under the tipple and its big saucer eyes glinted in the moonlight and fixed themselves on Bone. One of the boys gulped hard and somebody whimpered. Bone stood up. She'd never seen a dog like that, black, muscular, with pointy ears, though there was something familiar about it. The others rose behind her and she took a step toward the dog and it vanished. Ruby gasped, gasped. I really am going to pee myself now, Clay whimpered. It was a ghost dog, Bone marveled, a real life spirit dog, just like in Uncle Ash's stories and in that swift's mind tale. 
She flicked on the flashlight and motioned for the others to follow. Well, it's more like a devil dog with them ears, Clay said. Do you think there's some treasure buried there? Jake asked. This time, Ruby socked him in the arm. Ow! And then Bone walked to the very spot the dog had stood. This is where we cleaned up that pile of coal last Monday, Clay said, kicking at the spot. There wasn't any loose coal this time. Will let out a low, appreciative whistle. Uncle Ash always said spirit dogs would come as a warning, a harbinger of death or a bringer of justice. Or it could be like that dog in Swift's mind story, guarding something precious. But Bone had a distinct feeling this dog was trying to tell him something. Whoever Will found in that shaft had gotten himself killed right here where we're standing, Bone declared. No one argued with her. A real life devil dog was guarding the spot. There you go. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Okay, um, now we're gonna jump forward in time to um, Pakistan. Hannah, would you give us a, a couple pages of, and, and it's up, is it Amina? Yes? I say Amina. Yes. Amina, um, yes. Well, yeah. I appreciated that there was a bit in the story where she corrected someone on the pronunciation for her name and I thought oh oh good now I know how now I know how this and I put that in because I took it out during edits in the first book Amina's voice and mm -hmm. then everybody thought it was Amina which is another way to pronounce the name and then they'd hear me and feel so bad so yeah. I decided to work it into the sequel yeah. which I'm really excited to share so you want me to read a, a few pages yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, whichever, from wherever in the story you want. Okay, Sometimes. so this is uh, toward the beginning of the book. This is in the second chapter, and Amina has visited her family in Pakistan after many years. She's in a crowded market with her older brother Mustafa and her cousin Zora, and they've been warned by their mother, Amina and Mustafa, have been warned not to eat street food <laughs> for fear of getting sick, and her brother has just asked for some fresh squeezed pomegranate juice. The man cracks open a few pomegranates that are bursting with deep red seeds and feeds them one by one into a gigantic metal juicer that he turns with a crank. I try not to notice when he rinses the jug with tap water or when he pours the juice into three glasses that are murkier than they should be. Mustafa pays for the juices with the money in his pocket and doesn't need to ask Zora for help translating. As we sip the sweet tart juice through the thinnest straws ever, our cousin says a prayer out loud. Ya Allah, please don't let them get diarrhea. Mustafa and I groan in disgust and all of us crack up. My insides gurgle a little as we head to where the rickshaws are waiting, but I think it's nerves. We climb into the worn back seat of one of the three wheel taxis and Zora tells the driver where to take us. And then I brace myself for a wild ride. I haven't gotten used to everyone driving on the opposite side of the road here yet or all the activity on the streets. Apart from rickshaws and tons of cars, I've seen motorcycles with five people sitting on them, rumbling trucks painted in bright flower designs, and a bu bus packed with so many passengers that men were actually hanging off the outside. That was a video clip I sent to my friends, and they sent back emojis of shocked faces. Today, I see the usual bicycles with riders covering their faces with scarves like bandits to keep out the dust, a cart piled high with baskets of nuts pulled by a donkey and a skinny goat that looks lost. Whoa, I yell as we speed through a roundabout and I grab the handle as the driver swerves to miss a cyclist. He doesn't bother to honk, maybe because everyone else on the road already is. We're also driving on the line separating lanes on the road instead of between them. When he was here, Baba joked that in Lahore, traffic rules are more like suggestions. The way I feel on the roads is how I felt in general since we arrived in this country. In some ways it's familiar and works like back home, but in other ways it's totally wild and different. The result is a mix of fun and frustrating. And no matter how much I wanna fit in, sometimes I feel like I'm the only one who's holding on tight for the ride, trying not to fall out, get ripped off, or end up with diarrhea. A little sample. If that's not middle school life in a nutshell, <laughs> I don't know what else. All right, thank you, Hannah. Thank you. And Elizabeth, last but not least, we have our, our friend Myrtle. So, um, so my two books that came out um, simultaneous last, simultaneously um, in October were the first two books in my um, Myrtle Hardcastle mystery series. The first one, Premeditated Myrtle, sorry, I 
don't know where the camera on this computer is, Premeditated Myrtle, and the second book, How to Get Away with Myrtle. And they are about a 12-year-old girl in Victorian England, 1893. Um, she lives in a fictional village called Swinburne, who is obsessed with the new sciences of criminology. And in book one, her neighbor dies under mysterious circumstances. And she is so excited by the opportunity to solve a myrtle. A, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost the ability to say the word murder. <laughs> um, but she's so excited to solve the crime. Um, and right now in, in the story, a um, little bit of setup from, from premeditated, we have um, Myrtle's chief suspect in the crime um, is the niece of the, the murder victim who has come to dinner with her father. And um, she is, Myrtle is very concerned that the niece might have designs on her widowed father. And she is not at all the person that she wants for a stepmother. So um, the other bit of setup we need is that there is a cat in the story named Peony. And when Peony meows, it sounds like she's saying no. So. The morbid curiosity about what was happening in that dining room among father, Aunt Helena, and Priscilla felt like ants crawling under my petticoats. I'd stationed myself at the top of the stairs, straining to hear, but could make out nothing useful. Peony perched beside me, serenading the dinner party with an undulating song of woe and betrayal. I thought she was spectacular. Until Cook stepped into the foyer, dressed tonight as a butler, the master requests that the cat be removed, she intoned. No, said Peony. I gave a sigh and untwined my legs from the balusters. Yes, ma'am. I scooped up Peony, who responded with one parting utterance shrill enough to break wine glasses and carried her into the dark schoolroom. The curtains were still open and I noticed lights on across the way at Redgraves. Some, nights, some lights were normal, even with Priscilla over here, no one wanted to come home to an absolutely dark house. But these lights were upstairs in empty bedrooms, not down in the main areas of the house. And the lights shouldn't move. As I watched, one set of windows went dark. A moment later, the adjacent room brightened as someone turned up the gas. I chewed on my thumbnail, trying to decide what to do. I had three options, two of which were sensible. One, notify Miss Judson, her governess. Two, alert the diners downstairs, one of whom would certainly be concerned by nefarious goings on at Redgraves, but to whom I owed no duty of care. Three, investigate on my own. Dear reader, I will allow you to deduce what choice I made. Before I could talk myself out of it, I tightened my bootlaces, checked that my skirt hems weren't likely to be stepped upon, and loaded up my bag. Onto my head went my deer stalker cap. Last, I opened the cabinet and retrieved the key with the fleur de -lis handle. Peony, watching my preparations, almost gave me away. She twined about my ankles, complaining and ignored all my admonitions to shush. Do you wanna come? Yes, she replied and trotted out of the schoolroom down the back stairs to the scullery door. Thus, we prepared to commit the most egregious transgression of which a young lady of quality is capable. I was about to go outside alone after dark. Dear reader, surely I need not enumerate the dangers posed by my present course of action. They are drilled into every girl from the cradle by every possible means. I knew all about Spring-Heeled Jack, the fiend who stalked the pages of the Penny Dreadfuls, not to mention Jack the Ripper, the fiend who'd stalked the real life streets of London only a few years ago. There were body snatchers and burkers, named for Mr. Burke and Mr. Hare, the notorious Scottish grave robbers turned murderers. Press gangs waiting to drug the unsuspecting and ship them off to sea, and all manner of deviants ready to defile the innocent. I was not certain what this last meant precisely, except that it was practically guaranteed to occur the instant the young lady of quality touched her boot heel to the moonlit earth. Thank you. 
So we have three very different girls in three very different situations, but they're all in peril at the moments that you shared with us. Um, and, you know, there, there are stakes for them in all of their stories, some more kind of obvious than others. Um, but what I found that connected these three girls, even though they're in, you know, worlds apart, geographically and in on the timeline is that all of them are um, struggling with distilling their identity and you know for themselves but also in the way that other people see them so I wondered if you could each say something and I'll I'll you know call on some first. Um, if you could just say something about how, you know, the title of this panel is Girls in the World. Um, what particular challenges are there for your main character, for your girl in her world, in the world that she's in? And that, you know, these girls are also traversing um, multiple adventures in, in the world. And so, you know, multiple, multiple settings as well. So whichever one you want to talk about, but Hannah, maybe you could sh share something a little bit about um, the inspiration for Amina's story and um, what she's navigating in, in her world. Great, thank you. Um, the inspiration was really uh, a trip that I took myself when I was around her age uh, to visit family in Pakistan. And I, like her, hadn't been there in many years and wasn't sure what to expect. Um, in her case, she's actually a little bit anxious about going because of things she's heard in the news. Um, and when she gets there, she realizes it's so different from what she's expected. And uh, she confesses that she was nervous to be there, um, but she falls in love with the country. Of course, like you heard the excerpt, it's, you know, a, a wild adventure, but it's, it's you know, so much fun. She gets so much love from family. Um, she bonds with her cousins. She just is really sad to leave. Uh, and when she's heading back home, much like I felt when I was her age, she's trying to reconcile these different parts of her heart. You know, she's leaving this place that she's so attached to now, coming back to the, you know, the U.S. and the hometown. She lives in Wisconsin. Um, she's trying to, you know, get back to seventh grade. And she makes a promise to her uncle to share the beauty of Pakistan with her peers. And that's a struggle that she faces when she comes back, when she realizes that other people, much like herself, hold these very skewed or limited perceptions of what Pakistan is like. And when she sets about trying to change their perception, she realizes it's not as easy as she thinks it is. Um, but she's also trying, as you mentioned, to, to hold on to these different parts of her and figure out where her heart lives and, and how to honor all these parts of her identity that you know make her who she is. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I see her really bridging, you know, literally bridging two different parts of the world, bridging two different cultures, and also bridging who her friends think, you know, who she always has been to them, and then how this trip has changed her. Exactly. Right. So it can be really challenging at this age for real girls, but girls in books as well, to um, be allowed to evolve. Um, and Elizabeth, I, I see some of that with, with Myrtle as well. I mean, she's very headstrong. She's very sure of what she what her interests are. But there are a lot of things pushing back against her. So, yeah, and that's that's very true. And that's one of the things that um, in all of my writing, I think if there's any kind of message that I, I want to send to um, girls or boys reading my books, it's that there's not one way to be a heroine. There's not one way to be feminine. And um, right now, girls growing up in America are lucky enough to have not necessarily lived in a world where their dreams were impossible. Um, even if there are practical limitations to them achieving it. Um, but I, part of the reason that I, I write historical is, is to share the understanding that that wasn't always the case. Sometimes there were many factors at play that, that pushed against your ability to 
um, achieve what you were passionate about as a girl in the world that you were living in. Um, but also because even today, you might feel out of step with your peers, even if it's more, um, e even if you, it's, you know, you see a lot of female forensic scientists in, in on TV and in the world. Um, you might be the only one on your basketball team who is interested in 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 bones and and so i think even if um you're not necessarily dealing with the social pressures that limit girls ambitions you might have peer pressure or or just a feeling of why am i not interested in the things that my friends are doing and 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 feeling that little thing and i think that's where um myrtle kind of is is resonating with young readers i had um an email from a girl um named helen and the email had footnotes in it and and she she wrote to me and, and she said i am 11 years old and i study latin and greek and I had no idea that there were books about girls like me. And I said, yes, I wrote it for you, Helen. You you are the girl that, that I wrote this book for. So um, I think finding a way to give a voice to as many different characters from as many different backgrounds um, you know, is, is vital to, to share that ability to to dream big and to picture yourself and and you know our girls aren't going to be girls forever and um what they might like to find a foothold and and stake their claim in the world today yeah yeah that's i think that's a great point about girls you know at at, at this age especially you know their um identities are really evolving out of the you know what's been set up for them they're starting to make their own choices about what to do and um angie this sort of brings us really nicely into bones situation in this third book um because she has an actual ability that has um sort of shown up in her at a certain point which is tied a little bit to to her age and to you know where she is in life um, and in a lot of ways, it's accepted that she ha has this ability, but I think I got the sense that she was still sort of learning to navigate it um, and and still, you know, kind of figuring out what does this mean for me going forward? And there were still, you know, limitations. So maybe you can say a little something about, uh, you know, what that has to do with her, her relationships with other people. Oh, of course. And Elizabeth, love what you said about Myrtle and the, you know, place of girls in the world, because I kind of approach Bone in the same way, because Bone's gift is she has something that, like, there's a special, in her family, there are these gifts that, you know, pop up. Not everybody in the area has these kind of gifts, but it kind of sim for me it symbolized like this is her special talent, her identity. And at first, it's very much at odds with who she is because she starts out the the tomboy, the little tomboy, very much like I was as a kid. Um, and she's negotiating like how to be a uh, a young uh, woman, I don't want to say lady, because that's not the right word, in 1942, because there were certain, you know, there's still certain strictures on the way she was supposed to act. And she wanted none of that. She wanted to be, you know, in the first book, the her um, aunt tries to like, beat some of that into her that, you know, she's got to be the little lady and not uh, you know, explore her gift. And through the series of these books, she's getting used to this is who she is, really, and 
how she's going to embrace this identity and be in the world and be in her world where this might not be that valued. Um, I mean, it's valued in her family and in among her friends, but the way she is may not be accepted by the greater uh, community. And so she's trying to get, you know, she's becoming more and more herself in this. I mean, she embracing like how she can have this gift and continue being that engaged, uh, uh, fun-loving girl in the world uh, where, you know, and I think even now, sometimes when girls hit like 12 or 13, and they start losing some self-confidence and, you know, whether it's, you know, speaking up in class or being, you know, like, oh, they're not supposed to be interested in Star Wars or Greek and Latin or something like that. You know, they're supposed to be the little, the little ladies, whatever, however that is perceived at the time. And I think that they lose a little bit of themselves that way that perhaps they don't even regain until they're adults. So with Bone, I wanted her to be able to keep that like grain of like herself from childhood and still mature. So I hope that yeah. answers the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. And it brings up something else that I noticed about all three of your books in, in your series that you, you have, um, really significant adults in the books who are um, supports and, and like, you know, who really see the girls for who they are and almost kind of give them a preview or, you know, give them a little bit more of that confidence of like, I know, I can see who you are. You just can't see it yet, but I, you know, and, and really encourage them. Um, Amina has her uncle in Pakistan and uh, Myrtle has her governess and Bone has her uncle Ash. And, you know, this other, I remember hearing a quote once about the difference between middle grade, one of the differences between middle grade and adult is that in middle grade, adults are the lighthouse and in young adult, adults are the rocks. Which I was like, oh, wow. Does, but, is, you know, I don't know if that's true across the board, but I'd love to hear a little bit from each of you, um, maybe starting with Elizabeth, about how do you how do you have adults like active, helpful adults in a in a middle grade novel without taking agency away from your main character? Well, so so it's interesting. Um, I came to Myrtle. Myrtle was my first middle grade and I wasn't entirely sure I was ever, I didn't know I was going to ever write a middle grade um, series or voice. And so for me, the character of Miss Judson, um, her governess, felt for me sort of like my entrance, my my bridge into that world. Um, Miss Judson has gotten older in my head than she was when I first started writing, but I, I kind of had her pictured as that sort of 18, 20 year old ish, um, just former YA character. Um, but part of her evolution as, as that character is, um, she is a, a, a mixed race immigrant to England who would have been through all of the training to be a young lady of quality where everything that was not English and middle-class and ladylike and conforming would have been very systematically trained out of her. And so I think of her seeing Myrtle as a chance to turn that around for, for herself and for this girl that she has really come to love um, as, as, a, as a friend, as a sister, as a potential stepdaughter, just a, they, this incredibly close relationship um, as two young ladies of quality who are um, 
by which I mean they're they're middle class English women in the 1890s, and they have the, this identity that they are supposed to conform to, and neither one of them fits naturally into that mold. Um, and Miss Judson has been forced into that mold and plays the role very, very well. But she also knows what it's like to not be born to fit into that shape. And so while she is gently guiding Myrtle through the challenges such a person might deal with, you know, if you know how to play the game, it's a little bit easier to skirt the edges. So she's, she's trying to offer the benefit of that while making certain that Myrtle's spirit isn't so conformed out of her. So, so I think she's there to sort of ease the path for her. And then in, in another sense, um, particularly in, in book one in, in premeditated Myrtle, that they're mysteries. So the antagonist in the mystery novel is the murderer, but that person is not on stage actively opposing your protagonist's movements. And so that person, the person who is there to thwart Myrtle's goals at every step, um, becomes her father who is very loving and she adores him and they have a very close relationship but he's not quite ready to accept this daughter that has sprung up um, in, in with a with a passion for criminology um, and and he's not as as I'm sure many fathers of 12 year old girls are he's slightly befuddled by by this and so his efforts to keep her safe and keep her um, you know he at one point he says girls her age should be thinking about ponies and needlework and not dead neighbors um, and so he he represents sort of the the status quo and the the so I would say he's not the villain of the story at all, but he is the antagonist who is kind of that Myrtle has to maneuver around. So, so those are the two main adult characters um, with her. And, and that's sort of the, the relationship that I, I envisioned for this, this threesome. Yeah. I mean, we all, we know from a craft standpoint, you have to put obstacles in, in the way of your character or the story, you know, won't be satisfying. Um, and Hannah, in your book as well, the her um, ominous parents are, she's very close with them. They're very present in the story, but they're perhaps not the um, driving force behind her, you know, what, what she's trying to do. The thing that she's wrestling with is really more connected to her uncle. Um, and, you know, so I, I would love to hear from you about sort of drawing those adult characters without letting them overshadow her. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So I do think that um, that's something I'm conscious of. I, I realize that when I write middle grade fiction, my adults um, are sort of a, a friendly supporting cast for my main character. And um, and I think, you know, I draw from my own experiences, but also I, I do think that some kids, you know, do like adults, <laughs> um, for lack of a better word. I mean, I think of all the television shows my kids grew up watching where there were, you know, just these kids that just seemed to be growing up by themselves. And I was like, where are the parents or the, the caregivers in these scenarios? And even, I know that's a even common... like as little, little kids like Max yeah. and Ruby, like what? Exactly. They're just on their own. <laughs> yeah. and so for me, I, I do think there is a lot of that. And so I like writing, you know, families and, and communities and I think about the books that I loved as a kid, you know, like Ramona Quimby and like her parents were very much a, a part of the story and they, they still let her shine, but they were there. And, and that's what I try to do with, you know, Amina and her uncle, Amina and her, you know, her teacher who encourages her love for music, Miss Holly, um, even, you know, the Imam at her mosque, you know, they all play a small role in encouraging her in something that they, like you said, like they see in her, um, you know, a quality that they're trying to, you know, bring out. So even if it's the imam giving her tips on how to 
public speak and admitting his own fears that, you know, give her the courage. Or if it's, you know, Miss Holly sort of seeing that she's she's got this gift that she's not ready to share um, or her uncle trying to encourage her in different ways. Um, I think the, the key is really just having them there in moments and, you know, avoiding things like long lectures or, you know, the, the, I think the problem is sometimes writers might be tempted to use adults as like the voice of reason or, you know, their own voice seeping in. And so it's a matter of, I think, trying to make sure that doesn't happen. Cause I think that would be a big red flag for kids. Like ah, I'm being, I'm being preached to or told what yeah. to think. Um, so I think that that's, that's the balance for me is trying to like bring out the best of my character in a, in a friendly, supportive way. Yeah, yeah. Um, your mentioning Ramona reminded me that I wanted to make sure that I asked you about your own favorite, you know, girls in in books when you were younger, and if there are specific um, heroines that you keep in mind when you're writing, or that you just you know still feel connected to. Um, I mean, Ramona was a favorite of mine. Certainly. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for me too. I, Harriet I the Spy. Her. And, you know, there's a definite pattern in like girls who got away with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't, but, um, you know, so do you, do you look back? I mean, do you, Kathy, do you like vividly remember? Not everyone remembers, not everyone read a lot as a kid. And, you know, you can still write for children now if you didn't, but you know, what were you, Angie, what, what kind of stuff did you like reading as a kid? Well, I liked uh, reading a lot of stuff. And I think, you know, being a little bit older too, that we really didn't have a sort of a middle grade YA category when I was a kid. So I read all sorts of stuff. And I like, but I liked things like, you know, Chronicles of Narnia that it had, had both boy and girl characters that you could identify with. And they're out in the world doing uh, you know, in a whole nother world doing something, um, you know, and becoming kings and whatever, and queens and princesses. But, uh, you know, I wanted to, something that, that I think Hannah said about the adults sort of taking over a little bit that, and, and lecture, you know, becoming a lecture, I think it, when you're, it is a temptation of some writers to do that I kind of, in mine, I see that the, the adults really are co-equal characters in a lot of ways, that maybe there's some that, that they serve the purpose of being this, the status quo, like my Aunt Maddie, who doesn't like believe in, you know, thinks children should do certain things, but Bone's grandmother and uncle very much, as you said, see her and they know she has a certain power that is maybe co-equal to theirs and treats her that way within reason. And so that it's something that, you know, she will have a conversation with them uh, that she might not have with her father or Aunt Maddie because the father is off to war. Uh, but previous to that, he, he didn't really see you know, see the gifts or he wanted things to be a certain way. So, you know, I think the, those couple characters help by having, um, you know, if you treat them as equal to the children's care, you know, characters. Um, I know I got off off topic a little bit, but I just wanted no, to- No, no, no. I think that's, a, that's and it's that important is. to reinforce yeah. that point, especially for yeah. people who might be watching this conversation and you know haven't written for children but want to or I think there's you you have to you know if you if you catch yourself kind of casting yourself as the adult in the story I think you need to take a step back and try and cast yourself as the kid and right. really tap into you know what is what is that perspective like what you know I need to be in those shoes so that I'm not you know, as you said, Hannah, like, hand, like letting the adults solve the problems because it just from a craft standpoint makes the resolution less satisfying. Um, Elizabeth, what were you, what, what did you, what books do you go back to as a kid or as your kid self? Elizabeth? Uh oh. 
I had a little glitch there. Oh dear. Okay. You're back. Okay. I'm back. You're back. You're back too. We're all back. Okay. Um, uh, so what were your like favorite, your touchstone books as a, as, at, you know, sort of as a middle grade reader? If you as could. a middle, so I grew up reading um, lot, lots and lots of things. And um, I always get this sort of deer in a headlight sort of thing because I <laughs> forget everything that I read whenever somebody asks me this question. Um, but when, when I first started writing and I was writing fantasy, and so I, I mentioned earlier that um, one of one of my my key values as as a writer of of girl characters is that there are many ways to be heroic there's no one right way and it's because in so many of um particularly the fantasy novels that i read when i was growing up that i loved and still love and the authors that i admire so much um and then now i'm gonna point my fingers at them um and in a scolding way but but books like um the Alana, the the um, by Tamara Pierce, the Alana, the first adventure, and 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 then um, Robin McKinley's fantasies. There were so many times where, as a young reader, I was told that in order to go on an adventure as a girl, I had to dress up like a boy, pretend to be a boy act like a boy and not like anything that was traditionally feminine at all. And for me, the one that, that graded on my nerves especially was um, the, the key sign of a girl who cannot be heroic is that she knows how to sew. You put a needle in her hand and she suddenly forgets how to do, how to do anything heroic. And so um, I, I understand why those books were necessary um for girls of my generation and a little bit earlier but i wanted my girls to get to wear whatever they wanted so um um digger the heroine of one of my um fantasy series wears a dress if it suits her purposes she wears breeches in a doublet and pretends to be a boy if it suits her purposes um and so those are sort of, I, I was starting to, as a writer kind of, I don't wanna say I was rebelling against that, but I wanted to show another aspect of what a heroic girl looked like. And um, I feel like maybe those characters and those depictions aren't needed quite as much right now. Um, and as an author, it's, I, you know, I, I learned even for myself as an author that there are a lot of ways in which, um, you know, femaleness, girlness coexists with um, being the lead in a story, being the lead in your own life. So um, <clears throat> I, I would say, um, I guess that, I guess that probably answers it. Um, I read a, a lot of fantasy about strong girls who had to hide their identity. And therefore, I write about strong girls who get to be themselves. You don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that goes to show, right? Every sort of iteration of story is a response to something from before. And they, you know, Robin McKinley was responding to Tolkien and you were responding to her in a way, maybe it's, it's probably not that direct, but um, you know, what we read, especially when we're young has strong influence and it doesn't mean that we're going to uh, mimic it. It might mean that we're gonna push back against it or, you know, take another, another While way. While still embracing the parts yes. that, yes. that yes. we love so much. Formative too. Um, Hannah, what about you? What did you, what, what do you remember reading growing up? I'm, I, I think you and I are around the same age and I'm going to venture, I'm going to take a, take a wild guess and think, say there are not a lot of books for us as kids set in Pakistan. <laughs> there were not. <laughs> and nor were there stories of Pakistani Americans growing up in the U.S. Um, no. And I, so I, I really, yeah, I grew up not seeing characters, many characters of color at all, and certainly no one that represented me. 
Um, not that I realized it as a kid, you know, I, I devoured everything and didn't actively ask, where am I? It wasn't until later in life that I was like, oh, I, I wasn't anywhere. <laughs> but, um, but I grew up, you know, a, an avid reader. I loved Ramona Quimby, like I mentioned, I loved Judy Bloom. I loved stories that were character driven and realistic fiction. Um, I read Tolkien too, but um, my, my all-time favorite book was Little Women. And since we have writers here who write in um, other time periods, I think one of the reasons I maybe identified so strongly with it and actually wrote a Little Women inspired novel more to the story, the one right over here, was because I didn't see myself in, in the literature. And I think in many ways, the girls in Little Women or the women in Little Women um, were sort of similar to me, I saw myself more in them than I did in contemporary fiction that I read as a child. And that, you know, they were in a different time period, of course, but they also had different rules that they were expected to follow than what I, you know, saw around me, um, you know, when it came to gender norms, when it came to even things around dating and what was proper, you know, I, I grew up very much <laughs> being told what was proper and how I was supposed to behave. So that felt very familiar and comforting to me. Um, so I, I wonder now as, as, you know, I'm older and look back that why that was my all time favorite book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, it, that show, says to me that, you know, we don't always necessarily connect with the characters that we expect to connect with or the characters who, uh, you know, are like us on the surface. There, there are deeper ways to connect with, with characters and, you know, discovering a character who isn't doesn't look like you, but feels like you is, I think, one of the particular kinds of magic that um, books can offer and that especially middle grade can offer because this age feels so isolating. I mean, everyone feels different yeah. than everyone else, right? Someone told me once middle grade is all about blending in and high school is all about uh, standing out. Right. And yeah. I see that in my own girls, my own children too. Um, I would love to, so each of your girls is, you know, in a totally different time setting, in a totally different, you know, we have um, Victorian England, 1890s, rural Virginia in the 1940s, and Pakistan and the American Midwest now. Um, and yet I feel like these three girls would have a lot to talk about. They would have a lot, you know, they do have things in common. And one thing is that they each have something that they're really good at. And, and they're just, they're still discovering it in a way. But I would love to hear you say, you know, as a writer, how did you arrive at the gift or the talent that your character has? And what does it do for her? How does it um, help her navigate the story? Um, Angie, do you want to speak to that? Um, sure, since I have a book called Bones Gift. Um, <laughs> yes. the, um, right there. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the idea of what her gift would be is, you know, I wanted her to be a storyteller because that is, she's very good at um, both storytelling and sort of like figuring out mysteries. But she has, she's growing up in an region where storytelling is still an important thing that she's collect she in the very first book she helps a WPA worker collect folk tales and so she already knows all these folk tales and <clears throat> you know she loves anything like that's not real like you know folk tales myths comic books movies any kind of storytelling like that but I wanted to make it hard on her you know, because you want to make your care it hard on your character that her, you know, real gift, her gift she would get from her fan, you know, that family gift would be the power to see real stories, basically, um, that happen to real people. When she touches a, you know, an object, like she touches her, her friend Will's uh, dinner bucket that he's taken down into the mine. Well, it used to belong to her his father who unfortunately died when he had this on him. So she's able to see those like really, those real stories, those real painful ones. And she's had enough pain in her life, you know, mother's died and there's a lot of change going on. This should, that she doesn't really want to embrace those, that particular gift. 
but it's I wanted those two to be like paired, but that you know working against each other, and that's how like I two sides of the coin exactly. And so yeah. she wants to by the end of the series, she's kind of integrated that more that she's more at peace with this gift that she has because she could, she figured out she can use this gift to help people and to help the people that she loves like uncle ash mm -hmm. and figure out you know she doesn't know what she's going to do with it beyond that you know because she's not going to become like a healer or a vet or um you know herbologist like her 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 grandmother but she's trying to figure out okay what do you do with this stupid gift you know <laughs> what do i do with this yeah, yeah. Exactly. so the, it, it it offers her a chance for connection but it also there's a cost to mm -hmm. it exactly. which is that you know sort of balance that we have to maintain in mm -hmm. constructing a story and hannah what about amina she's um very she's musical and she acknowledges that she's good at it i liked i liked a lot that it wasn't like oh you know she wasn't um trying to downplay her talent and she she sort of embraces it and really revels in it and uses it also to connect with people yeah for me it was really um it was about overcoming um and you know sometimes we do have these these gifts or these talents that we're afraid to let shine and you know in Amina's voice that's really her struggle is coming to terms with with that and overcoming you know stage fright and and she does manage that. So in Amina's song, I was thinking about, you know, how she how she could push herself even further and challenge herself in a new way and think about new ways of sharing her gift. Um, but for me, you know, it was a lot of, I think I mean, as a kid, I, I like Amina was inhibited and shy and, and was afraid to speak in front of an audience. And I can't sing <laughs> and I'm not musical at all, but I thought- it I was, was gonna ask if you're musical. Yeah, <laughs> nope, nope. But my son is, and it was it was so fascinating to see that ability it, as, a, as a parent and, how innate it was for him and so that's why I wanted to capture that and even though he's not as much of a singer he's more of an instrument player and a music producer that was really helpful for me in creating Amina's song and the character Nico who helps bring out this new passion of hers um, but for me it was really you know that whole idea of how do you push forward in something that you love how do you use it to better the world in some way and to bring people together and and maybe grow as a person and, and find new things about yourself that you didn't know you had Great. And Elizabeth Myrtle has a lot of um, abilities and a lot of curiosity, and they do get her into trouble. So you too, I think, have played with that um, tricky balance of uh, her her gifts being an opportunity, but also um, potentially trouble. Right. And if if you ask her father, and in, in fact, Myrtle overhears a conversation between her father and her her, um, her governess, where um, he identifies her real gift as a knack for causing disruption. And she sort of takes that as a badge of uh, she's incensed first, like, what could what does that mean? But then sort of embraces that that sensibility. Um, and and runs with it and um i think this and i think for me this really goes back to um who i was when i was myrtle's age um i so so a lot of books for kids and for adults are about um kids finding their own identity and discovering who they are and finding their place in the world but I was a girl who knew what I was interested in and what I was good at and and had sort of that sense of self from a very young age and know what that feels like to have that when no one else around you really, really does and how um having that identity both helps and causes conflict with with your peers and um i i wanted to give myrtle that really strong sense of who she was what she loves where she's going what she wants 
and how having that passionate sense of self um, has causes her to run headlong into obstacles that she then has to either um, push out of the way, maneuver around, or or you know fall on her bum and have to pick herself up again. So um, you know I think I think it's so important to have stories for all kinds of kids and all kinds of readers um wherever you might fall on a given day when you pick up a book um and to see all of these different ways of being different ways of navigating um growing up and identity and learning what you love and how to talk about what you love with people who maybe don't understand your interests or share them. And um, so, so I think that's, that's one of the things that's so exciting about our panel in particular is that we have so many different kinds of girls who are in different stages of that journey. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and each one of them finds a different way, I think, to take a leap of faith and say, I, I do believe this is who I am. And I am going to trust the people in my life and the world around me to, you know, kind of catch me after I jump into it a little bit. And, and that is really empowering for readers to see girls doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to um, ask sort of as a from a craft standpoint because we who are watching this um about a little bit about sort of point of view and um voice so voices i when i teach writing um voice is something that it gets i get asked about a lot like what is it what do you how do you do it <laughs> and you know for me i don't think it's necessarily a choice I think we have just about five minutes left. So this is probably gonna be our last question. Um, I, you know, I'm curious for you as you're writing. Um, so uh, both um, Amina and Myrtle's stories are first person point of view and, the, and Bones is third person. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily think point of view is what determines voice. I think there's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. So I'm curious to hear a little bit about, you know, from each of you about your process and how did you find the voice of your character? Is it, um, is it a matter of decisions or do you find it more instinctive or, you know, sort of how do you, how do you get there? Hannah, could you, could you say something about that? Sure. Actually, it was something I struggled with. Um, Amina's voice was actually my first contemporary middle grade. Um, novel and um, ironically the voice was what the what I struggled with um, my first draft was in third person and um, and I think I let I was telling myself the story as many like I guess debut writers maybe do and I had unnecessary detail in there I think I I, I let the 40 year old woman writing the book creep in. And so she spent too much time like looking at somebody's throw pillows, you know, things that a 12 year old girl wouldn't care about. And when I went back and realized something was off and I got that feedback that the voice just wasn't right. Um, I went back and, and rewrote the book from the first person perspective. And I felt like what I could do then was trim the fat, you know, and all the stuff that just didn't matter. I could focus in on, like you had mentioned earlier, really her point of view and telling the story from you know centering her and and like you said it was a com it was it was the same story but just that that shift in perspective and really being inside of her and like feeling what she feels and and seeing what she sees um made made the difference so um for me is really it's i think it's emotions is this the hardest part and i think that and to get the voice right, I feel like it has to feel authentic and, and the emotions of the person have to match the age and the circumstance, like for me as a reader. Um, and that took me a while to figure out and for myself. And I feel like now, now I understand it a, a bit better and more intuitively than I did the first go around. Yeah, I think it, it takes time. It just, it takes time and practice and, it, and it's not the same for every, story. Some characters I think you hear so clearly in your mind and then others are, it takes, you know, I have to edit myself out all the time. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, Angie, what about what about Bone? Did you choose third person? Did it just sort of evolve that way? Well, kind of a combination of those because I I did I wrote my YA series all in first person, like an alternating uh, points of view, because that seemed like the natural thing to do for those characters. But for Bone, I wanted it to be more of a storytelling kind of a persona. Uh, and I did start actually in a little bit more in third omniscient, but as I was at it, you know, I wanted it to be more of her vo voice than a, another narrator voice. So I kind of brought it back down to, to third uh, limited to be her point of view, but she's naturally kind of a storyteller. So that, those are the kind of ways that she would tell a story. Plus, I wanted that more regional feel to it as well. That Because I interweave uh, Appalachian folklore throughout the, the series. And sometimes she's telling it, or sometimes there's somebody else telling it. But she's like living part of a folktale also. So that was sort that was a conscious way of building her voice and also you know I, you know i studied the appalachian dialect a little bit that that you know don't, you don't want to hit people over the head with it but just like this little hint of you know word usage and here and there and you know not necessarily in the narration itself in the third person part but in the dialogues but just a touch here you know to give it that flavor so it was a conscious choice to do it that way but also you know i kind of checked it by hearing it you know i'd read it to myself and you know is did that sound right and that you know, that was one my way to check myself so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do that too. I read aloud a lot, which is very awkward, but <laughs> it, has to, it really has to happen. And Elizabeth, was Myrtle always in first person? You know, yes, yes. There was no question that that Myrtle, <clears throat> Myrtle in particular, was going to be in first person. So far, every book I've written has been in first person, which I don't think was something I set out to do. And I don't think it's necessarily something I plan to do forever. Um, but on on that subject, I think that it's easier for a character to have a strong voice if your character has a strong sense of her identity. And so if you are trying to figure out who you are and you're trying to figure out how to write that character, it's going to be a little harder to find that so so in that sense because myrtle has such a strong personality that comes through um and then other aspects of myrtle's voice in particular are that it's victorian england and i wanted it to sound like a victorian novel that middle grade modern middle graders could find accessible so she has that um style where she talks directly to her dear reader and there are um she has the the capitalization of important words so whenever she talks about and it's usually disdainfully being a young lady of quality that's always capitalized and um so so we have those touches of victoriana that also seep into myrtle's storytelling voice um and lastly, she is um, almost over well read. She has she's she's so well read that she is. Um, I don't know if you've ever um, had a, a group of middle school writing students, 12 year old writers. Um, they love words so much and their writing feels so erudite and packed with syllables and sentences and big long <laughs> words and, um, yes and and so leaning into that and embracing that but she also has this passion for 
um, criminology and her father is a solicitor. Um, and so she knows all of these legal terms. And so her dialogue and, and thought processes are sprinkled with legal metaphors. So if I find a place where I'm writing along and think, how would Myrtle phrase this? And so when she's thinking about um, her neighbor that she, that she sees that someone has broken into her neighbor's house and is searching the house, um, she's like, well, I could tell my neighbor, but I feel I have no duty of care toward her. You know, she's like, I don't, that that's her legal phrase for saying, I have no sense of responsibility for telling Priscilla that her, her house has been broken into. So I'm just not going to tell her. Um, and, and so those, those are, you know, breaking down the components of, of Myrtle's particular voice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And I think it's, it's so, it's so effective to focus on what, what your character chooses to notice and it, that shows what's important to them. And that's a way of distilling character as well. well. I wanna commend all three of you for writing really engaging girls who in books that have like humor and poignance and love and kind of the whole package. And it's a, it's a difficult age group in some ways to write about because it's sort of such a moving target, but I feel like each of you, um, you know, connected so deeply with your own characters and it shows in your stories. So I want to thank you so much for being here today and for sharing about your work and your stories. Um, and I'm just going to read my, uh, the wrap up language. Um, so it's time for us to wrap things up, which I already said. Thanks to our speakers today and to everyone who is watching, please consider buying these featured books from your local independent bookseller or using the link provided in the chat. You can also check out other events in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book Book at vabook.org. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.